Um, so this was a rigorous program. I mean, think of Dawn, two big chunks of Dawn. And one was there was a training program taking mostly experienced worker owners and making them into what we call peer advisors. And then the other was the consulting aspect of it, you know, matching those peer advisors with the needs of startups and worker co-ops and in the community. This was a rigorous program, a year long. There were, we, we, you know, we're scattered around the country. So we had to do a lot of things online, 10 online webinars, two in-person weekends, which means people were flying in to some place from wherever they were. Needing to do a research project and needing to do a 40 hour internship. Um, so this was the training program as we knew it. And can you advance the slide, Josh? Thank you. And we decided, if I recall correctly, John, we decided early on this needed to be a certification program. Our experiences as worker owners with the co-op development field not really being tuned into worker co-ops, we wanted, to, we were sensitive to the delivering high quality assistance, really truly qualified assistance. And so we made this a certification program. Um, and so after this, after going through this year long training, there was a 50 to 60 minute face to face session with each apprentice. We did role plays. We grilled them on things. They had to present a research project. And there was a certification board, basically, that would um, made up of some outsiders and some Dawn members that would decide they were qualified to become a peer advisor. Any thoughts about that, John? Yeah, and, and not everybody was certified after the process. That uh, I mean, it really was um, uh, something that we all took very seriously. And um, uh, it was, uh, I, I think it was really incredible to, to do that. I mean, because people, we wanted to make sure that people were really uh, going to be representing us as, as, and doing the work that we were envisioned. Right on. Okay. Next slide, please. I, I will say my uh, my project was with the Hub Bike Co-op, which just shut down. So sad to see them shut down because uh, personal relationship uh, with that. And we did the Co-op Index, which I still talk yes. about experience when I'm telling people about the Index tool. It's a shame the Hub shut down. They were around a long time. Yeah, it's just, you know, the, the bike industry, the biking industry has just always been a, a struggle and it has, it, 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 uh, yeah. after the easing of the pandemic, a lot of, a lot of bike shops are really seeing uh, yeah. what, what happened to them. It's rough. Josh, could you back up one slide? I think there might be one in the middle there. Um, yeah, and so we didn't just certify, we also realized our field of, of worker co-op development is evolving so quickly peer advisors needed to recertify every two to three years. Um, so there were requirements for ongoing training. And in order to remain a peer advisor, you had to do some committee work in supporting the governance of Don, the organization itself. And um, and there were some uh, also a certain number of volunteer hours. Um, Ajwa is asking me, what was my project? Um, I believe my project as a peer advisor was actually to work um, to support University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives on a, a website project that they had going on. And so I remember that was big and long and complicated. I honestly can't remember the outcome of it, but that was my intern project was University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives. Very important, one of our, one of our very important think tanks in the, in the co-op movement and um, helping them out with a website project they had. So um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, in, in order to, okay, on, yeah, so ongoing, part of the ongoing training was what we called 200 level trainings. And John and I served together on one of the, one of the committees that was training and certification, um, and, and advanced topics. And one of our most fun activities actually was show and tell where different mm, peer advisors would do a presentation on one of their projects. And then everybody would sort of brainstorm it and workshop it and what went well and what could have been done better and how could it have been done better. And it was really to, to be able to talk shop about worker co-op development with experienced worker owners. That, that was one, we had a lot of special things, but that was one of the most special things to get together and talk about 
uh, just to workshop ideas and issues with each other um, when, when it was so was so rare. It was there were so few opportunities to really sit down and talk shop with other experienced worker owners. It was really a special bonding experience and show and tell is, I think, for me, one of the most fun things. Uh, John, any reminiscences you want to share about that? Oh, geez. It's kind of hard for me to remember all of it, but uh, I know there was a, just, I mean, there was just a constant, uh, you know, thinking of what, what else can we be doing and training? And I think we, at some level, we would have probably even had gone up one more level, but we always wanted to see this as a constantly uh, educational process. And, and, you know, keep in mind too, that, uh, you know, the goal also is that as these are peer technical assistance providers so that not only are they being trained, but they're bringing tools back into their co-ops that can, mm -hmm. uh, their co-ops benefit by having them in the organization as well. And so yeah. that was always thinking about what, uh, what more can we be doing was uh, constant. Yeah, that is, I will get to governance structure in a minute here, but John just reminded me of something that goes back to actually one of the first slides, the, the, um, no need to go back to that, Josh, but the idea of, building development capacity within the worker co-ops themselves. And it's to me an important thing in the whole field of co-op development is experience is the jewel of the realm really in co-op development. You know, the more experience you get, it, it, the, the more helpful you can be to co-ops. And it's really that lived experience of being in a co-op, but the lived experience also of helping many different co-ops it cultivates a brain trust, what I like to call a brain trust. And it's like that brain trust is going to live somewhere, right? And if as worker co-ops, we depend on nonprofit organizations or government agencies or professionals or whatever, if we depend on people outside of our co-ops for the expertise in strengthening and developing our co-ops, then we're going to cultivate a dependency. But if we cultivate are that expertise within our co-ops, then we can be more autonomous and independent as the co-op principle states. Mm -hmm. We can have that brain trust to ourselves within our movement so that if, you know, the grant funding for co-op development ever dries up or if, if we end up with a government that's hostile to cooperatives, for example, as has happened in a number of countries, then we, you know, we, we have, we can be independent. We can have our own development capacity, our own depth and breadth of development experience within the co-ops themselves. And we'll be in a much better position to prevail if conditions become unfavorable to us. So to me, that's a critical part of the vision here. Um, we did have a governance structure, even though we were never a legal entity unto ourselves. We called it a board of governors because it wasn't really a board of directors because we didn't really have a corporation or an LLC. And in addition to a board of governors, we had three committees, marketing and outreach, service and evaluation, training and certification. Um, and these, the, by and large, the governance structure of Dawn was volunteer and peer advisors were required to volunteer time within the governance structure. Um, and we also had an intake process that's important. And I'm not sure I gave that much attention in this presentation, but but you know when we had a, a, a form on the USFWC website, anybody who needed assistance could fill out the form. We had um, we had some paid staff. We had uh, ten, I believe, we had an intake coordinator at ten hours a week, and then we had, I believe, an administrative support person who would primarily support the committees at ten hours a week. And that was maybe not at all points in our. Our, our process, but I think that was when we were strongest. That's how we sort of divided up the work. And the Board of Governors sort of made policy decisions and coordinated things and helped with coordinating strategy and all, but there was a lot of work that was done in the committees to get the word out to people that we were available to them. Um, service and evaluation was focused on ensuring the quality of service that the peer advisors were delivering and training and certification, as we mentioned, was to provide initial training to apprentices, 100 level training, and then 200 level training to peer advisors in an ongoing way to support recertification and ongoing education. It was a lot of work. I'm, uh, the, 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 one of the things I think we would, I would look to improve was 
we, we tried hard to come up with a more streamlined governance structure over the years, and we never quite did. And this governance structure, it worked, but it was a lot of effort. Um, John, do you have any reflections on our governance structure and how well it worked or didn't work? <laughs> I, you know, I think it, it actually worked very well. I, I, I think we, uh, it, it, I, I didn't really have a lot of uh, critiques of it. I think the bigger issues is that, um, you know, we never really had uh, the the autonomy that uh, I think we really needed to have, and so there was always a, a battle for resources and uh, and challenges with that. And I should say too, uh, although it's not really part of the governance structure, we also had a very strong commitment to humor and having fun. <laughs> So, like, if you were to say the Board of Governors, you were supposed to refer to governors or greet each other as governor, but with a really bad British accent. Accent <laughs> upon certification, people would be given, given a, or they would either choose a Don name or they would be given a Don name uh, by the group. And uh, my, mine was uh, Donnie Marie. I don't know what yours was, Jim. I forget what yours was. You're embarrassing me because I think I might have forgotten my Dawn name, actually. <laughs> I can't remember. Oh, my God. Okay, yes. that was fun. We were, we were definitely about having fun. We did not have any secret handshakes, though, but I imagine over time that would have probably developed. I think we would have. And it, it reminds me, though, I mean, to me, the highlight was, again, when we were strongest, we got together twice a year. Everybody flew in from everywhere. And we had these weekends together where we would conduct business, we would have elections, we would, you know, do certifications and, but just hanging out together and going out to a restaurant and, you know, staying in some, some place that had a hot tub or something, you know, it was just wonderful to be together and to talk shop. And there was this special vibe, even as we were all from, you know, very different parts of the country. It was, there was a, a, an esprit de corps that was really one of the highlights of my life, frankly. So yeah. it was beautiful. Um, so yeah, admin contractor, 10 hours a week. That's the uh, itemization of what the admin contractor did for the committees. Very important. An interesting model too about the tension between volunteer work in the, in the organizational structure versus paid work. And I think one of the strengths that I would say is we didn't have any full-time employee. Everybody who put in paid time, 10 hours a week, the admin contractor and the intake coordinator, they were an active worker owner at the time also, and I believe, and they, um, and so, and, and they, and they reported to a volunteer board or a volunteer committee. And so I think that was one of the strengths that really kept the, the worker owners, the members of Dawn stayed in charge because the paid staff responded to the volunteers, basically. I thought that was a, a potentially very sustainable structure, even as sometimes I felt we were all kind of overworked. But anyway, um, next slide, please. Um, intake coordinator. This is a very important position. Um, and intake in general in co-op development is very important and challenging because you're basically scoping the request. Someone's coming to you for help with their co-op or their startup. And, the, and you need to sort of have a very global view and you need to do a lot of listening and, and there's a lot of insight that's required. Um, one of the things I really liked about our structure was um, peer advisors were required to work intake rotations because in my opinion, it's one of the best ways to get a feel for what's going on out there in the, in the, the realm of the worker co-ops and the startups and where are things at? What is the state of the field? You could really get that by doing a couple of months of intake, fielding intakes. And so I felt it was one of the best ways to train peer advisors um, and, and to help build that brain trust of knowledge and expertise is to really you know, tune in to what's going on with the people in the field. Um, so I'm not sure there's anything else there. Yeah, we, we would uh, go ahead. Uh, and, and it's kind of funny because uh, at, at NWCDC, we're just sort of building now after, you know, 20 plus years, uh, an intake system that kind of doesn't look exactly like this, but we have one person who handles the first call and then we have a, a monthly, um, a weekly stand-up meeting 
to where the general development team reviews uh, all the intakes and we it helps us uh, keep each other accountable for the process also make sure that we're all seeing what's out there and so yeah a lot of, not thinking about how much i've internalized some of this but i guess i guess i have yeah we i remember we had a, a series of flow charts um <laughs> weeding out the wackos thank you hazel yeah the uh it was we did refer things out we, we would get some really wild things one of the more common things we would get is <laughs> we would get field a call from somebody and they're like i really want to start a worker co-op but i want to have a veto over everything you know if the worker owners end up doing something crazy i need to be able to step in for them we're like well you know i'm sorry that's not a worker co-op you may want to start a nonprofit organization we got a lot of things like that where people just didn't get the whole it really is a democracy thing so um the um anyway so you know, yeah, yeah just ahead. a little side aaron dawson and i had a meeting at the last time the worker co-op conference was in chicago uh, with this person who uh, they wanted to start a co-op that would do bike pickups of uh, waste oil from restaurants that would then be used to turn into biofuel. And uh, we get through the whole thing of talking with them about it. And then we ask the question, well, how many people do you have involved? And he says, well, no one. And then I asked, we asked him, well, who's going to do this work? And they said, well, we'll find people. And I thought, well, you know, you really should have people that want to do this work. Yeah. <laughs> Riding your bike around, picking up waste, oil from restaurants cannot be fun in the summertime. <laughs> and you know, and we still get stuff like that where people have a great idea for a co-op only they don't want to do it. They want right. other people to do it. So, right. And the, and the worker owners will just own it and then we'll farm out the work to non-owning workers. <laughs> yeah. we, we also, we actually had an item on our intake form that was for one person with an idea, right? And <laughs> Because we got a lot of that. And we was like, well, you know, you need to have like at least three people if you want to start a co-op, frankly. And it was, was, was what we got a lot of one person with an idea, you know? So it is what it is. The whole population is still learning about what really is involved here. Um, yeah, you're right. Understanding workplace democracy isn't something society prepares us for. Quite the opposite. I would say we're actively discouraged from exploring workplace democracy, but that seems to be changing too. Um, oh, so a lot of operational stuff on the part of the committees here. Um, client evaluations were hard to get. It was really hard to get cl our clients to give us like evaluations about how well we did. Annual peer evaluations. There was one time John and I ended up wrangling, you know, we had a 360 uh, method for a while where every peer advisor got to give feedback to every other peer advisor. And I remember one weekend, John and I ended up with a massive amount of work trying to compile all the different feedback that came in. Um, that was, so there was definitely a matter of streamlining systems so that we're mindful of how much labor we're getting ourselves on for. Um, so that's, that's committee work. Uh, you can move on if you want, Josh. I should point out one of the most fun things we did was the ask the peer advisor, uh, uh, sit downs at conferences. Sometimes it was a booth. Sometimes it was just a desk with a couple chairs. But I think that was one of the most engaging and fun things is to just sit at a conference and people would come up with their questions and you could be there face to face with them. So this is probably our, one of our busiest and biggest years. 15 active certified peer advisors. We had four that cycled out. We did have a fair amount of turnover in peer advisors mostly having to do with people just going through life changes. Um, we did have a, a type of membership professional and co-op development organization members. We wanted to have ties to the larger cooperative movement. That was one of our motivations there. And they represented an important resource for us as long as they really got worker co-ops, which there are, there are co-op developers and other allies who have never been worker owners, but they do understand worker co-ops. Those people are out there. Working pro members, a lot like I became, you know, I I left my worker co-op in 2009 and became a freelance co-op developer. So I guess I really should have been a working pro member at some point. Um, there were a lot of the, the, the training course, the year long training course was so rigorous. We actually had 17 apprentices who did not complete the course. 
another thing I would rethink, would there be an easier way for people to go through the necessary training and become certified? Because we did have what I think is a relatively large number of people falling out of the training before they finished. Any thoughts about that, John? Um, yeah, I mean, it would definitely, uh, it could, I mean, I, if we were doing it, they would probably have something that would be more, more streamlined and, and maybe more self uh, or asynchronous learning and other, other types of programs. I think it was, you know, um, the amount of time that Don was really active was, you know, really, you know, about five or six years. So we didn't really have enough, I think, time to really sort of do a shakedown cruise and, and make new iterations. I think that would have happened. Uh, and we probably would have, you know, had we been, had, it, had enough time to really, uh, you know, build that sort of experience and, and knowledge. Yeah, right on. Um, so a, a, a ton of co-ops here. These and it includes some of the biggest and oldest co-ops in the country at the time. Um, you, some of y'all may recognize some of the names here. Uh, yeah, go ahead and go ahead to the timeline, unless you have something you want to reflect on with that previous slide, John. No. Um, so this is the rough timeline, and I may need to stand corrected on this. <laughs> John's memory may correct me on some of this, yeah. but um, you know we. We got going there that, yeah, 2013 to 2016, I would call the peak years. Interesting to know how much activity we did, but I think the maximum budget we ever had was 50,000. I don't think we ever cost more than that. And I think that delivers a lot of bang for the buck, considering we had, I think in that year, we had about 15 active peer advisors, the training program, everything that was going on, working the conferences, and we still only soaked up 50,000 in grant money. Um, to me, that's, that's, you know, in terms of the amount of assistance that we delivered, I think that's an incredibly good value myself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, considering, you know, it's not even one full-time employee, really, right? Sure. Um, maybe if you're in a low cost of living area, that's one full-time employee at a co-op development center, maybe, right? So, um, so in 2018, yeah, in 27, 2018, this is a much larger topic. I don't know how deeply we can go into this, but one of the things that happened as the Federation grew, as the Democracy at Work Institute was formed, the 501c3 arm of the Federation, it, we no longer, as a project of the Federation or as the project of the Democracy at Work Institute, we would, we would have a staff liaison from those organizations but after a number of years, we lost, we lost our direct connection to the decision makers. And so my recollection in 2017, 2018 is we couldn't get a, a direct access to decision makers as, as a project. And we, um, and we couldn't get a budget. We couldn't negotiate a budget. And I understand that, you know, particularly as things evolved, there was a question about on the one hand, Oh, thank you. The, the funding generally came either through the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops or through the Democracy at Work Institute. And we sort of moved back and forth between those two organizations in terms of who our parent organization actually was. Uh, often our money would come from the a USDA has a co-op grant development grant program. Some of our funding came through that. Um, but it could be challenging to get. I realize it could be challenging to get funding for us. Um, mm -hmm. But the main thing that I, I found was, to me, that where th we really struggled at some point was when we could no longer get direct access to the decision makers. We were an autonomous self-governing network, but the U.S. Federation of Co-op, uh, U.S. Federation and also Democracy at Work Institute, they needed some sort of accountability. That was a conversation we had a number of times, especially starting in 2016, 2017. What does accountability look like? if Dawn is an autonomous self-governing organization. And we would try to negotiate a memorandum of understanding, but it was very difficult and time consuming to actually settle on the terms of how are we accountable to the Federation while also being autonomous and independent. And it, it touches on the question of we never had our own uh, funding stream. We never had our own legal entity. We were dependent upon those two organizations for both of those things. And I believe that was something that, you know, came back to haunt us in the long run. Uh, John? 
Yeah, I mean, so it started as the when it was the as a project of Dowie. And then once it stayed a project of DAWI, then DAWI became a 501c3. And then at some point, a decision was made by DAWI and the US Federation for it to go to the US Federation and get off of um, basically DAWI's books. And, uh, and that was, I think, probably like 2017. And then in 2018, it, it, uh, the Federation killed it.